NBC10 Boston brings you Climate 2024, proudly presented by National Grid. Climate change is taking a toll on our planet. To fight it, the state and the country have big goals for a clean energy economy and a workforce to match. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our latest Climate 2024 special. I'm Hannah Donnelly. This time, we're tackling jobs. In our past specials, we dove into why climate change is such a threat and how being more carbon conscious in energy creation and distribution can help us ease the problem. Now, we're diving into what it'll take to get workers trained to create and implement green energy infrastructures and support systems. Here's a quick overview of the need. Greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, enter the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels, like oil, gas, and coal. The CO2 that gets trapped in the atmosphere causes the planet to trap too much heat, resulting, at this point, in a global temperature increase of about 1.9 degrees Fahrenheit. That has caused erratic and potentially life-threatening weather patterns, leading to things like flooding and drought. But scientists say if we cut carbon emissions down to as little as possible, we can mitigate the problem. One way of doing that is by replacing fossil fuels with electricity as a source of energy. We see that happening in transportation with electric vehicles. We also see it in homes and buildings that use electric heat pumps for heating and cooling. I'm not going to say it's going to be a hard thing, but it's something that we should get ahead of. We have the technology to do this work. We just need to make sure that we support the infrastructure to carry it. Meantime, alternate ways of harnessing and carrying energy, like those relying on wind, solar, geothermal drilling, and even hydrogen, ensure the electricity powering those innovations is carbon neutral. So we see that there are ways to fight climate change and help the environment, but people are needed to install those heat pumps, rewire those homes, work at hydro plants. You get the idea. And in fact, people want those jobs and for a good reason. The Environmental Defense Fund recognizes the existential component, writing, employers across every industry and every sector now recognize that in order to attract top talent, they need to lead on climate, justice, and equity. Young professionals want their careers to do more than just make money. They want to make the world a better place. Those good intentions also come with good benefits. The Brookings Institution writes that for workers in clean energy, Mean hourly wages exceed national averages by 8 to 19 percent. Clean energy economy wages are also more equitable. Workers at the lower ends of the income spectrum earn 5 to 10 dollars more per hour than other jobs. Brookings goes on to say that higher ed is also less of a barrier in clean energy, writing, this is especially true within the clean energy production and energy efficiency sectors, which includes sizable occupations like electricians, carpenters, and plumbers. Roughly 50% of workers attain no more than a high school diploma, yet earn higher wages than similarly educated peers in other industries. Here's more insight on the high demand for electricians in particular. The electrical industry is exploding right now. The the move to electrify everything um, is opening the doors wide open. We want to open it and make sure everybody gets an opportunity to be a part of it. Considering all that, it's no surprise that nonprofit net impacts find demand for jobs and energy and clean energy remains higher than supply. But that might not be for long. We'll get more into that in a bit. First, let's dive into how to spark interest in the science and climate oriented jobs in the first place. At Boston Children's Museum, they might say it's early exposure to STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts and math. And so here in the STEAM lab, we really like to take advantage of getting, providing access points for kids and their caregivers to try something out that's STEAM based, see what they feel about it. They might learn something new and exciting that they were surprised about, or if they're already excited, it's a place for them to come and kind of dive more into that. We do a variety of programming. So we have daily drop-in program, um, where you might be doing something like designing with bricks or making parachutes or testing what sinks and floats so you can stop in, try it out, stay as short or as long as you'd like. We also have some extended programs that are workshops, and those are more for our older friends in the museum, so more like our six plus with caregivers, and they might be doing things like learning how to do wood burning or soldering or sewing a creature um, or doing some coding and uh, making a snow plow with Lego robotics. Hola, 
like science. You like science? Yeah. What do you like about science? Because sometimes things Mama. explode like a volcano. Yeah. So we know kids from a very young age start to get ideas for what they are good at or not good at. Um, and we really want to provide an opportunity to have fun, open-ended, um, exciting activities to really engage kids. I'm holding it. You are. It's balancing, but it's not falling. But again, because STEAM is across many disciplines, what's really nice is it provides access and many entry points. So even if you're coming in and maybe you don't feel great about math, you're doing an activity that involves multiple disciplines. And so that's an opportunity for them to kind of come at math from a different angle or try things in a little different way. So what we hope to see is them engaging and taking that chance, even if they're coming in maybe with a negative that hopefully when they leave, they are thinking something maybe a little different than before. The kids you saw there are at the very beginning of their education and could be considered part of a talent pipeline for science and clean energy workforce. More exposure can lead to more interest and excitement, like at the Dearborn STEM Academy in Roxbury. Kids there recently got a lesson in the kinds of jobs that could have their wheels turning for the future. So the Dearborn STEM Academy is a 6 through 12 school, an open enrollment school in Boston Public Schools. We serve every student in the district. Doesn't matter how they walk in, they walk out a Dearborn graduate. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We have National Grid speaking to our seventh graders, and they've been doing this all morning, is really exposure. So first, we want to make sure that our students are exposed to all of the different STEM careers. And National Grid has been an exceptional partner in that they not only come over to the school, but they also provide these experiences for our students. So the students are able to look under the hood. When you call National Grid, you get a gas leak. Well, the program is called Clean Energy Tech, so that's where the EV focus comes in. So the students are learning from an EV specialist, why EVs were developed, why they're good for the environment, and potentially uh, if they work for National Grid, what kind of vehicle they might be driving. We also have a National Grid work truck that works on regular day-to-day -day maintenance, but then is also um, sent out during storms. And then we also have a front loader and a excavator. Never too young to start the interest. So they said the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. And so we're thinking seven, eight years down the road and we're planting today with the hopes that in the next six and a half years, the students will uh, flourish into uh, mighty oaks. A strong science foundation like those kids have can naturally lend itself to pursuing a technical and trade education. At Franklin Cummings Tech, workforce training and competitive trades like those related to climate solutions are the order of the day. Benjamin Franklin Cummings Tech is a two-year technical institute that offers a wide range of certificate, associate, and bachelor's degree programs. Rotate the bolts on the base to secure the calibration frame. With many changes that are happening in the clean tech industry, there is a lot of demand for candidates that can be a part of the growing clean energy industry that can take up jobs in the uh, solar photovoltaic slash uh, offshore wind industry or even electric vehicle industries or even building automation systems. Uh, all these areas are some of the major areas where the clean tech jobs are focused in and Benjamin Franklin Cummings Institute is a premier institution that offers programs in all these areas and we are trying to bridge the gap between what the industry needs and what the students can get from the industry through our programs. So we've had a partnership with National Grid for many years, and we've been working very closely with them uh, to recruit students to be in that programming to further their career development and exploration and to uh, connect them with mentors who are already in the field so they can transition uh, into a career in the gas and utilities field and energy and clean energy. National Grid is able to connect and sort of develop that workforce, that next generation of talent that can be in the clean energy space and the utility space and uh, coming from our pipeline here. 
My name is Quentin Gamner, and I'm a renewable energy student here at Franklin Cummings Tech. I'm a student interested in engineering. I love building science, which is specifically, you know, making homes and buildings more energy efficient using softwares to really look at like home designs, how you can make them, you know, energy efficient. In 10 years, um, I would be an engineer, um, ideally for a national grid, you know, really focusing on renewable energy. Uh, I know that's like the, the big push that they're trying to center, so I would love to be a person leading that charge. So that would be a dream, yes. Opportunities are very big for cybersecurity. I will definitely recommend, um, as somebody who is a woman in STEM, there's much more people, as me as also Latina, who are wanted to get knowledge and also wanted to get a career in tech. I really uh, have many opportunities here. I have a career service advisor who is able to provide me this opportunity, such as National Grade Cohort, which has been very insightful for me. So I'm here uh, to where looking for a cybersecurity position. I'm actually the only woman in my degree. It kind of feels lonely, but I'm pretty excited to get to know much things. Step three, position the adjustment frame for calibration. I would say that the careers that our students are being prepared for, there's attractive compensation. So that's another reason they're coming to Franklin Cummings Tech to be able to tap into that and have that financial freedom and security moving forward in the future. So what will the hiring landscape look like for students once they graduate? And what kind of jobs are we talking about? The 2023 U.S. Energy and Employment Report put out by the federal government says 114,000 clean energy jobs were added in 2022, bringing the total number of such jobs to over 3 million. And those jobs are found in every state. It also says clean energy jobs are currently 40 percent of energy jobs, with the biggest gains in sectors like wind, solar, new electric power generation and zero emissions vehicles. E2, a group of business leaders and investors, says that from 2020 to 2022, clean energy jobs grew faster than the overall energy industry and overall U.S. employment. It's a trend that could continue because of the recent Inflation Reduction Act. President Joe Biden signed it back in 2022. It's meant to create jobs by investing in clean energy, all with the goal of decarbonizing the grid by 2035 and achieving overall net zero emissions by 2050. Tax incentives that go along with the act have led to investments in wind, solar, and EV manufacturing, creating new positions for electricians, mechanics, construction workers, and technicians. Over the next decade, the legislation is expected to create a total of 9 million clean energy and climate-related jobs. Here are some examples. They, people in their homes have a lot of gadgets that interact with the energy system. There are different ways that uh, things can happen now. And so cybersecurity is a huge area for the energy industry. And then understanding the computer systems. You know, there's been a lot of talk about AI. Um, what's that going to mean for the energy industry? And so, you know, we're moving at a pace now uh, with skills that are going to be necessary. And I think that's the challenge for the industry to keep up with that and to make sure that we're kind of out there training and then hiring uh, at the level necessary for the future. The Atlantic Council, which is an American think tank, says all this means we need to grow and upskill the U.S. labor force. They say the three fields with the largest demand will be builders, factory workers and electricians, adding Policymakers must find ways of retaining current workers and attracting younger populations to the clean energy trades, which will require robust education and training programs. National Grid has already instituted its own training program. Here's insight from Amanda Downey, Vice President of Strategy and Partnerships at National Grid. So at National Grid, we are committed to delivering clean energy affordably, efficiently, reliably, in a very equitable way. As we transition into the clean energy space, it's a very exciting time at National Grid, but we have some challenges that we're facing. 
We don't have enough workers. In Massachusetts alone, National Grid has about 6,500 employees who will be eligible for retirement, about 50% of them. And so we're going to need to replace those that are eligible. And so as we think about the, the clean energy transition, we will need workers that have new skills to deliver the innovations that are needed in order to deliver that clean energy. At National Grid, we have a strategic workforce development initiative that allows us to, in a very comprehensive, sustainable, systematic way, build a pipeline of diverse talent to meet our workforce needs. You're never too young to learn, and we know that we have to start reaching them earlier. We have four clean energy academies, middle school, high school, college and university, and certainly work-ready adults. We are working with Boston Green Academy. We are working with Dearborn STEM. Uh, at the college and university level, we are working with Franklin Cummings Tech, Northeastern University, and certainly UMass Boston. Those are all considered our strategic education partners. We're having lots of success. They love the mentoring op opportunities. We provide them with scholarships to almost 100 students, and so in total, more than $300,000 so far. When I think about our Energy Infrastructure Academy, you don't have to have a college degree. You don't have to be an engineer, you don't have to have a bachelor's or a master's degree, but certainly a high school diploma. And so we've been able to, in a very short period of time, make sure that at least 50 of the graduates get full-time jobs at National Grid. And I'm talking about full-time family supporting jobs, jobs that have the opportunity to change a person's life forever, for generations to come really. If they go to nationalgrid.com, that's a really good place to learn about our four clean energy academies and certainly all of the employment opportunities that are available at National Grid. Governor Maura Healey is working on generating more jobs for that trained workforce. She's proposing a $1 billion 10-year climate tech initiative to make Massachusetts the, quote, climate innovation lab of the world. This is expected to create well-paying positions across the Commonwealth. Two things to note about the transition to clean energy jobs. The first is that organizations like the World Economic Forum are aware that the clean energy economy will lead to a loss of jobs in the coal, oil, and gas sector. But in this chart, you can see the expected global net gain of jobs by 2030. Despite the coal, oil, and gas losses, there is an overall gain of more than 10 million jobs. There is also an awareness that more diversity is needed in clean energy. The Brookings Institution writes that the clean energy workforce is older, dominated by male workers, and lacks racial diversity when compared to all occupations nationally. Fewer than 20% of workers in clean energy production and energy efficiency sectors are women, while black workers fill less than 10% of those sectors' jobs. The institution says all that could indicate some barriers to entry in the field. It's one of the topics I recently discussed with a panel of experts. And thanks to our guests for being here today. We have Amanda Downey, Vice President of Strategy, Partnerships and Development at National Grid, Oliver Sellers Garcia, Green New Deal Director for the City of Boston, and Allison Dunn, PhD of Worcester State's Earth Environment and Physics Faculty. Welcome to you all. Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. So, Allison, I want to start with you to kind of set the scene. We talked about this a little earlier in the program, but how important is a strong green workforce right now? I think it's absolutely vital for our future. So the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center estimates that we're going to need nearly 30,000 full-time equivalent workers to help implement our clean energy infrastructure. Um, in addition to that, in Massachusetts, our infrastructure period is old. Mm -hmm. um, it's aging. Many um, of our systems need to be upgraded just as a matter of course. So we have this huge opportunity to build in climate resilient upgrades and also upgrades that will help us prepare for the storms of the future and the sea level changes of the future. And so we need this for workforce to help us kind of on an individual basis with home efficiency upgrades, um, with taking out our oil furnaces and putting in heat pumps, with installing solar panels. But we also need it on a much larger scale um, on the community level, mm -hmm. um, rebuilding infrastructure for the stronger storms, um, you know, changing our systems to prepare for sea level rise and how we're going to adapt. So really there's a whole suite of areas where we're going to need to 
build up our workforce and our capacity in the future. A lot of things you mentioned there are specific also to Boston, to the state, to the country, but also to Boston and Oliver. I know that Boston has a lot of green goals for 2030, 2050. How do those initiatives really emphasize the importance of the green workforce? We know that we don't have enough workers to carry out our goals. That's the very simple answer, but it's a little more nuanced than that. So we need more workers. For example, we're nowhere close to meeting the state's 100,000 heat pumps by 2025 installation goal. But we also have incumbent workers who all they need is training and some certification to be able to move into a greener job. So for example, landscapers can move into maintaining native species and green infrastructure. And then we also need to see more of some of the big regulatory and market shifts that are gonna create employer demand for these changes. I look at, for example, the wonderful uh, pilot that we're doing with National Grid um, at Franklin Field in Dorchester mm -hmm. where we're putting in a geothermal system. That can allow gas workers to transition into geothermal, but there needs to be many more projects like that. And so you talk about this implementation there, Oliver, and the, the partnership with National Grid. So Amanda, I'm curious how National Grid has, you know, this clean energy transition has impacted your workforce and how you, you know, we Oliver brought up that that one example, but how are you guys helping your employees make those transitions? Yeah. First, let me say that at National Grid, we are focused on ensuring that we are building a smarter, cleaner, mm -hmm. uh, more uh, uh, resilient energy system. Um, we know that, much like what you've said already, Oliver, uh, that we're going to need a huge number of workers in the future. The Mass CEC report that recently came out, that 3,500,000, um, I should say, 35,000 uh, right. workers uh, <clears throat> over the next several years, we don't have enough trained people to take all of the clean energy jobs. At National Grid alone, we're gonna be investing about two billion over the next five years. Where are the workers coming from in order to do the work um, to support the investment that we're making? And so we know that we can't sit back and just expect uh, young people when they're in high school to want to be in the energy space. Mm -hmm. And so we've developed a strategic workforce development initiative where we go inside the schools. We can't wait until they get to college, which is another reason why from a pipeline building standpoint, we have developed uh, an academy that where we go inside the middle schools. We're in you know, Boston, we're in Worcester, and so as I think about the work that we're doing, it's really across uh, four clean energy academies where we hit and work with middle school students, high school students, college age, focusing on engineers, and then work-ready adults. So it's not only transitioning those that are already in the workforce to get there, but it's recruiting new employees, Absolutely. new workers. So Allison, have you seen an increase of interest from students because of, you know, this climate and climate change solutions are top of mind? Yes, absolutely. So I feel like I see this in my own students at Worcester State University. <coughs> Many of them are worried about the future. And so what we really have a need for is problem solvers at all levels. So, you know, at the college level, I work with, um, you know, undergraduates getting their bachelors. We need to do start to produce many graduates with the technical and engineering skills to approach these problems um, because they're going to be the ones designing um, the infrastructure of the future. And so mathematical and quantitative skills are going to be key to that. And I think it sometimes is easy for students to say, well, math isn't my thing. I'm going to work on something else. Mm -hmm. And then they get to college and they realize, oh, these good opportunities are closed to me. And it's very hard to develop those skills um, once you're in college. So we really need to make sure that they keep on the math education throughout the um, K-12 journey. Um, we also need all our students and um, you know, to be able to communicate effectively, both orally and in writing, because no matter what career you go into, you're going to have to work with other people and be able to express your ideas and communicate them. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so, for example, we need municipal planners. We need people who can figure out how to make cities and towns resilient to future climate. We need to figure out, out where to site new turbines. We need the scientists and engineers to help us with that. But also, we need those um, jobs that don't require a college education. Those are so important. Um, electricians are really needed, especially for the new heat pump infrastructure. That requires four to five years of training. We can't turn it around on a dime. We really need to invest in that type of training. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the capacity in our vocational and technical high schools right now to meet um, even the demand of our current students. So right now, they can only seat about 61% of applicants. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's so interesting because it takes all kinds, right? It's not just one job that we're trying to fill here. There's so many different different jobs and there's so many different skills that we can kind of utilize. Oliver, what specializations are you looking for in the city of Boston to achieve these goals and to create this workforce? Well, I want to pick up on something Allison said that I think <clears throat> just to highlight what is so important here is to really kind of do away with the misconception that green jobs are one kind of job that you need a very specialized degree for doing something with very complicated technology. And I'd say it's really exactly the opposite. And so I can tell you that we are looking um, to find what are some of the uh, fields that we can successfully create pipelines in where we know we're either the anchor employer or we know that they lead to um, stable employment career supporting careers, I mean a family supporting career is so important. So something as simple as uh, training um, drivers to get a commercial driver's license, mm -hmm. well, we know that we can hire them as school bus drivers, but they will also be driving an increasingly electrified fleet, and so a little bit of extra training there put, makes that a green job. I think that it's really important to think about how so many professions that have um, training are really able to transition their existing and new workers into the green economy simply by what we are deciding from a, a, a policy and market standpoint to spend our energies on. And so I think, for example, <clears throat> electricians come up over and over again when we think about the programs that we're doing in the city for EV charging, to support um, seniors and low income um, property owners put in heat pumps, to do uh, more energy efficiency and insulation, rebuilding our bus corridors. What are, what are those jobs? They are electricians, they're contractors, they are, they are laborers of different kinds. These are jobs that are incredibly important and can support a lot of economic growth for a family, but they, are, they become green jobs when we focus them on initiatives that are building the resilience and um, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions that we've been talking about. And could I follow up on that? Mm -hmm. I think one thing that will be really important in the future to address and kind of move forward those initiatives is to bring the training into the communities that need them. You know, bring right. it into Everett, bring it into Malden or Dorchester. A lot of those communities have people who would be interested in these jobs if they had the training. And often the training is somewhere that is inaccessible, even just getting that last mile after public transport. So really it has to be part of a, a whole system of um, support and building that workforce. Thank you so much to those experts and thank you for watching. I'm Hannah Donnelly, see you soon.